Science Films TV episode one. Yeah. Mad Science Films. We don't have a talk like a normal person. Is, is this how we talk? Like Mad Science Films. We will get better, we promise, as, as we go along. Probably. Bear with us. Yeah. We'll find it out for you. Yet another vlog by two white straight men uh, talking about popular culture because there aren't enough of those out there. We're not represented. Yeah. Oh, God. All right, let's, let's move away from that right away. We kind of come up with a format. We'll have a chat each week about like general movie news. We'll also have a chat about what we've been up to. And we'll then just have a little matter about like what we've been watching, reading, listening, you know, whatever like has excited us in these past week. Um, um, notes of certain media you've ingested. 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 Wait, which that's actually a good band. In fact, I might ingest it. It's part of the uh, educating gym, which we're going to do later on. Yes, this uh, is a this is a special segment which I came yeah, up with. Um, Jim wants me to educate him with the world of metal, and we've got very similar tastes when it comes to films. Music, not so much. And uh, Jim is a big fan of the metal. Um, me less so. I want to be educated. I want, by the end of this, to kind of go, you know what? The metal? I like the metal. It's not all about grrr. It's not all about It's, 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 there's a lot, there's a lot to metal. There's a lot of little branches with it on that metal tree. That, 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 which that way depends on where you're facing the stage, I think. James Morris. Uh, Thomas Savory and Sam Thompson worked on a short film which had its world premiere at Cardiff International Film Festival. I went along to uh, just document its world premiere. It was a very exciting day for the boys. Yeah, and how smoothly uh, it all went. Yeah, what's the video? Tom Savey, the co-director of Billy. Hey, uh, Sam Tomlinson, Cardiff filmmaker and director of Billy. And today we uh, had the official first screening of it at Cardiff International Film Festival. Hi, my name is Tony Farrell. I play Billy in the short film. The idea, my, well, my parents got a care agency, so it literally came from a care agency. You know, we work with people with Alzheimer's, dementia. So yeah, it was pretty much I found when I was going to see these people, um, the almost side effects of the condition was effectively being haunted, so that one or two issues I'd turn up and she would forget, well, one of the people would forget where I was. I'd been there and, I don't know, I guess the cog started ticking, so to speak. Basically, I knew one of the producers, uh, having worked with him on a previous film, like the Living Dead, uh, the director of that film, I knew quite well. So I had a personal connection, um, went to meet them, looked at the strip, loved it, um, and I just connected with this guy straight away. It was a script that Tom and the other director were sat on for a long time, because he, he, um, his full-time job is working with people with mental disabilities, so he sees day in, day out, um, just how harrowing it is to actually have these ailments and, like, and what they actually go through. So a lot of the script, um, it wasn't us trying to hit horror cliches, it was like genuinely real life incidents that he's had to talk to these people about. It sort of actually started off as a project to try and kind of just kind of educate people on it, but then it just turned into a full fledged horror and we just kind of ran with that idea. But a lot of the ideas that ended up in the final film were original ideas that have come straight from people's experiences. No, oh, fantastic. Um, I think the film's been quite well received. Um, people buy into the storyline. I uh, know, it's been a really good experience to be fair. I'm delighted for them. I'm delighted for the team because, you know, young guys trying to make the mark and uh, I, I really think they made a great end product and uh, I was happy to be involved. We got upgraded, which is really nice. We got to see it in the main hall instead of, uh, you know, a small room upstairs. 
Um, so it was big, it was loud, and we actually had a good audience, not just people that we had brought, but um, people that are actually filmmakers and, and critics that were there as well. Um, so it was nice and uh, seemed to get a good reception. People seemed to jump at the right bits, so it was good. festival their, their, their first year um, if you couldn't tell <laughs> I know I it is a chance for them to show off their skills their talent all their hard work they're very precious over the projects they're very excited about showing it off to the world and that should be respected and considered give them the information which they need like screen times venues um, categories if they're nominated where the festival um, award ceremonies taking place what time all that relevant information just just inform them because they should not be chasing that information i i, I think i think that, that that's the problem is is where they were let down i think they did a great job on the promotion and all of that yeah but where they got let down was on the really boring stuff but also the really important stuff which makes a film festival go like the yeah. organization and the admin uh, for sam and tom this was their first directorial uh film um you know, this is the f and they got accepted into this festival. You know, they paid a thirty pound submission fee. And then when you added these festivals, they need to run smoothly. You're kind of stressed enough about your film being shown to 
the general public, the last thing you need to worry about is if it is in fact going to make it to the screen. Yeah. Sam, the yeah. you know the co-director, uh, yeah. you know he. Sam was... is a very technically gifted guy. Thankfully, he was on hand to help out with the screening of his own film, but that shouldn't really be taking place. That I mean, the the film festival organisers they they boasted of the fact that they had like fifteen hundred submissions, which is a huge number. And if they were charging at least a minimum of thirty pounds uh, per submission, that's that's a lot of moolah. Where did that money go? Oh, they had sponsorship as well. To point out this is the Cardiff International Film Festival, not the Cardiff Independent Film Festival, which is kind of like the polar opposite. Those are guys who I don't think they'll mind me saying probably have lost money on the film festival in the past because they put so much effort into the organisation, promoting the films as well, uh, bringing like you know renowned directors from across the UK. We've had Stephen Frears, who did High Fidelity, like John Bourne, oh uh, who did Excalibur, he did Zardoz, which is, yeah, Sean Connery in a red nappy. Check it out if you haven't seen it, it's amazing. You know, these, these guys who wouldn't have come to Cardiff if it hadn't been for the efforts of the organisers of the Cardiff Indie Film Festival. I was having deja vu to the, the Swansea Bay Film Festival, um, which started off really well, just started getting lazy. Um, there's a great documentary, which I'll dig out the URL for and stick it in the show notes uh, called Looking for an Audience um, and it just shows again how shambolic and shoddy it was and it's almost as if the Cardiff International Film Festival guys saw that and went that's a good idea we'll, we'll copy that I hope for next year it runs I hope they've learned some important lessons I'd like to believe it's incompetence on their part rather than taking the money and run you know selling selling the festival as a package is part of it you know you have to get it out there but focus on the content which you're showing to and put some time and money into that what we've been watching watch oh we should do little jingles oh just that that was it that was the jingle i've done it what we've been watching <laughs> Beautiful. Ooh, yeah, like that was nice. Yeah. We used that. Harmony. So, uh, I've been watching Stranger Things, like most of the world. Um, I've got to catch up. I've only done season one. So, yeah. season two was released on Halloween. Halloween, yes. And the good thing about Netflix is they allow you to gorge on the entire season. You I don't think that's a good thing. I like it because yeah. it's down to me to use my own willpower, not to cane the season in one sitting, sitting there with a tub of Hagen Dazs in my pants. <laughs> battering 10 hours of Stranger Things. That's an image. <laughs> Here's the video, no, you're joking. <laughs> <laughs> Where the first season is kind of more claustrophobic, more based around the, the group of kids and uh, and Eleven, and it's kind of them fighting this kind of, you know, government scientists, very evil people, but this is kind of different now. It's gone from that kind of small group to the town. It's 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 coming out, it's like broadening the, the, the horizon. I love that retro 80s look. I love the synth. I mean, you, you give a good analogy with it, don't you? What's the... Uh... Oh, yeah. It's it's like John Carpenter and Spielberg having a baby, and then the baby is obsessed with the 80s as well. Mama. Audience now, I mean, us being in our 30s, um, <laughs> the main audience, <laughs> cinema goers, TV watchers, we, we were so nostalgic, particularly in the horror sci-fi genre, about the 80s, and I think maybe they were tapping into that for Stranger Things. Back to Netflix is The Babysitter, which I think was actually filmed in 2015, but then eventually got picked up by Netflix and released this year. Well, I enjoyed it. Um, it's, very, it's very well shot, shot by Shane Hilbert, who worked with Muck Gur, the director. Muck G. Muck G, Fortunate of Salvation. Obviously, totally different kind of film. But, you know, very well shot. I love his use of camera angles. Very well thought out. Um, and it starts off like this coming-of-age comedy centered around this this young lad. Um, and then it just rips up the script, goes all mental. Eli Roth go satanic, demonic, omen style mm. Um Brilliant, yeah. It's a real shift. And I, I love films which have that kind of shift. Mm. Um, like from Dust Till Dawn starts as like a gangster yeah, kind right, of yeah. thing and then goes straight into like, you know, vampire, you know, chaos. Felt very much like an 80s throwback as well, similar to the kind of Stranger Things thing. So again, 
Definitely. You know, there were bits where they were filming uh, the main girl, uh, you know, in slow mo, and there were like, you know, uh, lawn sprays going yeah, off yeah. everywhere, and it was, it felt very much like those '80s films where they, you know, linger on. Kind of like the suburbs in the sense that it sets the neighborhood, the yeah. suburban neighborhood, and oh, nothing can go wrong here, yeah, and then boom, and then yeah, mental the show. The other thing it reminded me of um, was. Because the, the, the main character, he's what, like 13, 14? Yeah. Like he's, he's, he's like a young teen. It very much felt like those kind of like teen horror books from the 90s, you know, like point horror and that kind of thing. Um, and it was great kind of seeing all this messed up stuff from his point of view. And they didn't shy away from the gore at all. And there were some no. very impressive kills in there. And, and my hat's off to Muck G for, you know, not being a horror guy, but bringing the gore and bringing the horror to it. Um, but it was fun to kind of see it all from his point of view, quite an innocent point of view. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then, you know, yeah, they, they frequently make fun of the fact that he doesn't know what an orgy is and all this other stuff. And, and he, he just thinks, oh, you know, they're having an orgy as opposed to having a satanic rites. It's naturally going to have funny points in it because it's a child trying to understand and fathom the horror. Yeah. Um, and it is a comedy. Um, and I found it was quite funny that cheerleader with the breast thing and yeah. some brilliant I can't remember I should have wrote them down but some brilliant lines in the, in yeah, the yeah, film yeah, yeah. Um, and some genuine very tense quite a scary moments in the film too which is great so you know often if you're doing a comedy horror you can miss out on the horror or the comedy but to get it all working in one yeah you know, good job on that. So yeah, is there any films that you'd say if people liked Babysitter to to? Uh, yeah, um, I think. I mean, it, there's a lot of influences from Edgar Wright and the Shaun of the Dead kind of films. Again, if you're a big fan of those kind of comedy horrors, but but they really push it more. So it's like like I said, Eli Roth kind of style of gore. Gotcha. But I th and, and because it's only a few characters, it's very much like the eighties where they isolate the character and it, it's not like a broad kind of horror it's very you know one one person one enemy one location that kind of simplistic yeah. uh, storyline to it i mean i thought the characters were amazing and probably like the strongest part of the film because the, the setup apart from the twist is is pretty by the numbers mm. um but it was the characters the you know the archetypes they had fun with them yeah yeah um, you know there's the jock there's the cheerleader very stock 80s kind of characters yeah there, off the shelf yeah but they have fun with it and, yeah, and they yeah. take them to extremes like yeah. the, the jock guy basically you know there's a line saying why does he have his top off and there was no good reason but you know what? i actually thought that but then i suppose that's the whole part of it yeah. like yeah i'm asking that question too why yeah. has he got his bloody top off you have the same mentality as a 14 year old i do yeah another one on netflix which i would recommend if you like the babysitter is a film called detention again directed by a guy who's not a horror director uh, i forget the guy's name but i'm fairly sure he directed talk which is the Lawrence Fishburne motorbike Fast and Furious ripoff from the late 90s. Not, not a good film. Um, but he did Detention, and it's got this the same kind of like humor horror kind of vibe to it. Non horror directors directing horror. Because um, again, you think of something like the most well known and well thought of horror stuff The Shining, done by Stanley Kubrick. Mm -hmm. yeah, never touched horror again. Uh, the Exorcist by William Friedkin, not really known for his horror stuff. No. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm a horror fan, I'm a horror filmmaker, I love working in the genre. Um, but it's always fun for me to see when non-horror guys tackle the horror genre. Yeah, definitely. Um, which very neatly segues into the movie news, which is about the Halloween reboot. So, which is written by David, Danny, Danny McBride, McBride yeah. and David Gordon Green, who are probably well known for working together on Your Highness, which is, you know, just stoner. It's, it's a yeah. fine, fine film. Stoner medieval comedy. It is like watching the Princess Bride uh, block up to the hills. You know what I mean? Brilliant. Okay. But again, comedic writers jumping in. I mean, I think writing comedy is quite difficult. So if you can write comedy, I think you've got a good shot at writing other genres too. Yeah, I mean, I, I think like horror and comedy have a lot in, in common. Um, a lot of it's about timing. A lot of it yeah. is about trying to do like a primal uh, response from an audience. You know, in horror, you're trying to terrify somebody. In comedy, you're trying to make somebody laugh. A lot of people kicked off. They were like, what the, what the hell are Danny McBride and David Gordon Green doing with it? Uh, it's Bloomhouse Productions. They've kind of gone out of their way to get John Carpenter's okay about the whole project. Which I think is important at the end of the day. 
I think it's important. What, what, what do you think about there being another Halloween film? Well, see, there's so many sequels to Halloween um, done by uh, Mustafa... Uh, I think. Which I didn't. I didn't hate. I mean, I grew up watching those kind of films, and yeah. they, you know, there's a there's a bit of nostalgia there, and I can I can I can respect what he was trying to do. I mean, I don't think Carpenter was interested in following him on after the third, was he? No. Um, and then we had Rob Zombie. So, well, there was seven and eight, but that's kind of just. Oh, come on. Eight had Buster Rhymes. It was a trick-or-treat, mother... If I think about it, I mean, I probably prefer Seven and Eight than I do to what Rob Zombie did to the Halloween franchise. Um, stay away from remakes, Rob Zombie. Not everything is set in fucking Texas. Not everybody has to have a beard and long hair. I know I have a beard, but nevertheless... Your hair is quite short. But he's got such a strong style, Rob Zombie. Um, it just... It just taints everything that he does. Do, do a Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I, I think actually Rob Zombie doing a Texas Chainsaw Massacre would suit. Carpenter's recently said it's it's kind of set in an alternate reality uh, as opposed to the reality where Halloween actually happened. Um, where they ignore everything apart from the first film. But I, mean, I think the two. <laughs> well, sure. And don't get me wrong. I think, you know, apart from... So they've gone all Star Trek with it. Well, no, no, no. I mean, they've, they've gone Halloween again because Halloween 7 H2O uh, ignores everything after Halloween 2. Yeah. Um, so they're kind of rebooting the rebooting and ignoring the remakes and, and the sequels now, which, okay. I mean, it's getting very complicated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My own personal thing is, I love the original Halloween. Um, remake sequels, sure, go for it. Like, there is always the chance that they're going to be great. Um, and so, you know, more stories told in that world, sure, okay, it could, it could be good. Um, more often than not, they're not. Uh, I like, think there's more pluses for me than this. Oh, I'm, I'm going to end up watching it. Other than John Carpenter, you know, directing it himself. Um, I think he's going to do the, the score for it as well. Uh, you know, they could probably just dust off the original and slap it on. What if he will kind of evolve it? <laughs> well, he did, he, did, he did the Halloween 2 soundtrack as well. And yeah, yeah, 3, which obviously yeah. is the non-Michael Myers. -y. I mean, the Bloomhouse guys, they've got a good track record. Uh, they've done some, I mean, you know, they're, they're great at churning out the franchises, but they're, they, you know, they're also putting out some interesting horror stuff as well at the moment, um, which, you know, doesn't necessarily work as a franchise. Um, so, yeah, we'll, we'll see. Uh, they are making all the right noises about being respectful to John Carpenter. Um, you know, I kind of suspect John Carpenter doesn't really care as long as he's getting paid. I mean, like, I think probably if you trolled back, he probably was okay with the Fog remake as soon as the check cleared. Oh. I, I, I'm, I'm that sure must have been a fat check. <laughs> I, I, I'm sure if you asked him now, he'd express a different opinion. And you know what? God bless him. If he wants to just, you know, sit around uh, watching basketball and getting high, he, he's, he's made some good films. Yeah, let let him do it, you know? And if people want to keep on giving him checks to play with his characters. Cool. He deserves it. That guy's in so much for horror, yeah. you know. So there we go. Don't die, John. Don't die. Oh, dude, why would you even say it that? It just went in my brain and I have to say it. Oh. We love you, John. Educating you. That's why you say I'm sorry to What's up, people? This is Educating Jim. We're going to educate Jim on the topic of metal. So up first is Thrash. Mighty, mighty Slayer. I've heard of them. Yes. <laughs> it sounds like bumblebees. Can you feel the music? Yes. Oh, that is, that is the human voice. All right. So yeah. So so that was the Thresh Metal. Yeah. So thank you for joining us, episode one. I think you'll find that that was a smooth production. I know that nothing went wrong behind no the scenes here. No whatsoever. Uh, I can't prove it either. Yeah. So uh, join us next week because we're going to be here. So you know, and the internet. Churning out content on a regular basis, people. The internet's pretty empty, so I mean, what else are you going to be doing next week? In the words of Ed Wood, our next one will be much better. 
And don't forget to subscribe, leave some comments. We're open minded people, you know, any. <laughs> Sorry. Jim's we will we will read them. <laughs> and any tips, hints, advice, you know, lay it on. Yeah. Please subscribe. Wait, where's that? Where's the subscribe? Is it? I, I promise you the next one will be much better. <laughs> so, m moving on. <laughs> let's, uh, let's, 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 let's move on with that. Yeah, I, with that. there's going to be some editing there. Alright, Jim, what have we got next then, mate?